Welcome everybody. We're doing a kind of a, an expert Q&A session with Tyler Grace on spray finishing on site. This is uh, a topic that I know Tyler gets pestered about a lot on Instagram, um, asking, well, what's your, what, what sprayer do you use? What paint do you use? What's your prep steps? Um, so we figured, why don't we just do a webinar and try and answer a whole bunch of questions in one go. So we got some photos here aside from this one of Tyler's face. It's a good one. It is a good one. Um, Tyler, I'm pretty sure everybody knows who you are at this point, but why don't you give them a, just a, the real quick version of what you do. So I'm a small remodeling contractor. We uh, self-perform most trades. Uh, I sub out plumbing, electrical, HVAC, specialty stuff, but we kind of like to keep our hands on almost everything else, um, usually interior work. Cool. And... People are telling me that that chat is disabled. I don't know why hmm. that would be. It shouldn't be. Well, everybody can use the Q and A function instead. That'll work. Um, uh, so let's dig right in, Tyler. Um, the first and obvious question is probably um, why spray finish on site. So. I don't know. I guess because it's a lot. I, so people think that it's um, faster, quicker. And I feel like when I started spray finishing initially, it probably was quicker. And then the more involved you get in the higher grade of finish that you're looking for, it might end up being more work. Um, I think <clears throat> at the end of the day, the way that we've been approaching remodel projects, we're just painting absolute last thing. So we're masking and protecting everything all at once. So spraying isn't that much more work at that point. And you, you're talking about you spray everything, walls, built-ins, trim. So our what job, won't you spray? So I, I mean, typically we're not spraying. We're a lot of times on bigger jobs, we're spraying primer and then back rolling. Um, right. So to get that on. So even our job my job now i'm working by myself now uh because of everything that's going on but tomorrow i'll be spraying primer back rolling and then sometimes i'll finish coat the ceilings once just because after everything's in you're going to hit them and have touch up and then usually you can get away with one final coat at the end mm -hmm. um but cabinetry millwork trim doors um pretty much anything brick brick really i didn't know about that yeah. Our last um, job, so what's we the best, a ton of brick. What do you, what, what, say, put a pin in that. I want to come back to that because I'm, I'm interested in the, in the, in the topic of spraying brick. Uh, Cause I know there's a lot that goes into that. Um, let's talk about the thing that nobody, everybody wants to skip past the prep work and go like, you know, what's the, what's the secret? Like, how do you get such nice? And I'm, just to give everybody kind of a little taste of, let me see here. You're looking at my screen, right? Which, which is a good photo to pull up to, to give people a sense of the, of something that's freshly sprayed um i don't know any of them so that's that's sprayed the same night but that's kind of after it's flashed off at that point yeah um, let's see let's give them a uh let's give them a wet coat somewhere so that's gotta be some that's right after spraying right uh maybe <laughs> you can't even I tell don't, i don't i don't remember um <laughs> There should be some, maybe, maybe the, uh, the, one of those mantles might be wet. The door. Here we go. This is wet. This has to be right. I don't know. It's taking forever. Uh, actually those aren't wet. Um, they're freshly sprayed, but so what, what was your question that, about wet paint? Well, let's, no, let's, let's talk about site prep first. Um, we're already getting some questions about, um, about how do you set up in a room without any ventilation? I mean, I know, why don't you talk first about what you do in a room that you can set up ventilation? So you want to basically whatever air you're trying, you're trying to get um, changes of air within the room. So you want to be pulling clean air and then you want to be exhausting that air outside clean as well. So you need an inlet and an outlet and then generally wherever you're pulling from, you want some sort of, whether it's a charcoal filter or filter, so that once everything's turned off, it's not drawing back into your finished space. Right, and so you're looking for a pretty good cross ventilation, right? So you need to ideally have at least two openings, one on either side of the room, right? 
Yeah. So it all, I mean, it depends on every job. Uh, I think that if you have enough air exhausting out of that room, you don't necessarily, the, the openings for what you're trying to intake, it's not quite, you know, you don't necessarily need to place them in certain areas. If you're able to move enough air with what you're taking out of that room, one 12 inch by 12 inch, 18 by 18, 16 by 16 opening with a filter on it would be plenty of air um, for what we're spraying. So we're spraying primarily on site. We're spraying water-based finishes. Right. So you're not as worried about, you know, uh, explosions and that kind of thing with your finish or, you know, passing out because of VOCs. You're, you're mostly worried about overspray and just kind of clearing the air, right? Yeah, basically with the water-based finishes they cure so quickly so if you're not getting that out of there it kind of sits on the finish before it's completely cured and then you get this gritty finish afterwards once you kind of rub your hands over it so you're more so trying to get the particulates out of the air um the respirators that i use you're not smelling that it's not necessarily for vocs or because it's an it, you're not looking to reduce an explosion or prevent that obviously that's great but we're just because most of our jobs it's owner occupied mm -hmm. so if we're using a solvent it's got to be a solvent that cures really quickly like a shellac um that doesn't smell for that long i it's tough to spray oil um in a house it's tough to spray a lacquer in a house because it off gases for so long that you just smell it forever right Right. So, I mean, so what's your, what is the solution for when you don't have any ventilation in the room? Uh, would you just not spray in that room? You just spray somewhere else in the house, set up a kind of a shop somewhere in the living room or whatever. Um, is so <clears throat> what I have done, um, is you can exhaust out of the room that you're in and then have charcoal filters on your exhaust so that your clean air is coming out of that room. So you do still have like a change of air or you can, so the room I'm sitting in right now, we sprayed shellac primer on all the walls and all the trim because it was old trim. So what we did is we had the door blocked off. We had an inlet on that and then we had an outlet. And initially I just had the exhaust going out into my house. And then when I got done spraying, I was like, that smells horrible. So then you can either put a charcoal filter on the end of your exhaust or at that point, take it out a window somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. So what we got up on screen here is, you know, this is, this is from an article Tyler did for us a few years ago. And that's, um, that's my John Madden pencil right here. So I can circle things and draw plays for defense. Um, but I mean, here you got this whole wall masked off and then you've got a box fan. I think there's, I think you had three on this job. Yeah. Uh, with a like a furnace filter over each like clip to each one and, and they're all pointing out and exhausting out those you're saying that if I was blowing into an interior space you could use these filters in combination with a charcoal filter and and sort of just be filtering out all of the just so same you, way that same way same way a respirator mask would filter it out it's kind of the same thing what I'd use in in that situation would be um, like an air scrubber outside of the space right uh the dry ease those little blue ones you can put outside of the space and they will draw that air outside it's just at that point once it's coming out of that room you either need charcoal filters on the outlet of that or you need to be exhausting that outside the house at that point i gotcha um uh, so like box fan wouldn't be the best case in that situation okay um you mentioned uh solo spraying and back rolling how do you juggle that workflow by yourself? So basically you're spraying your primer on just for speed. Um, you don't have to dip into a roller pan, anything like that. So you're just going to work in sections that are workable for you. Get it on the thickness that you would if you were rolling it. And then um, I just have a basically a dry roller that you're adhesion and um, especially when you spray ceilings you want that texture so if you have to touch anything up it's not a smooth surface gotcha. it's, pretty, it, it's pretty straightforward just get it on and then roll it um not surprisingly we made it 12 minutes before people started talking about what kind of finish do you use so sure. um, we should probably spend some time on that i'm sure this is something we'll revisit as we're going through 
Um, you mentioned using water-based finishes. I know from talking to you on your on a lot of your jobs that one you've used is Target Coatings, which is New Jersey, right? Yeah. Um, um, and I've used their stuff too. They're awesome. Yeah. So there's uh, there's a ton of products out there right now. And I think everyone wants to know what product. They see a picture and they're like, what finish are you using? Right. And I think that there's so many variables that go into that. And there's so many variables that go into spray finishing and budget and what you're spraying. Are you spraying trim? Are you spraying millwork? Do you need to prevent blocking? You know, we're typically at this point not spraying any latex paint other than a ceiling paint. Um, but there's a company called Target Coatings that if you're spraying cabinets, uh, you can spray with HVLP. Um, mm -hmm. Sherwin-Williams makes a product called Chem Aqua. The only issue I ran into with that is there's they're only supposed to mix that or um, pigment that in certain um, dealers. I don't know what, I forget exactly why, but there's a certain way that it has to be pigmented and regular Sherwin-Williams dealers aren't, they aren't supposed to be doing it. So you can have issues with it. I know a lot of people will. So where um, do you have to go instead? There's like certain, I forget why, but there's like a certain process or the way that it has to get mixed that there's only certain dealers that have the equipment for it. Um, but the, the issue I have with a lot of that is you, you walk into a store like that and it's a kid who just grabs it and mix it just like he does any other paint. And then you're kind of running into issues and banging your head against the wall, which can happen with finishing anyway. Um, I've used for trim, I've used Sherwin Williams pro classic, which is an acrylic. Um, so it's not as heavy. It doesn't block. It cures harder than a, a true latex. Um, I've sprayed their trim, their urethane trim enamel. Um, I've sprayed a product called by Lenmar, which is actually a Benjamin Moore company with HGLP. And then um, there's a, actually a line of paint that they carry by, I believe, Intellex, but it's owned by Benjamin Moore that's called Cabinet Coat, which I'll use on a ton of our trim because it cures really fastly, really quickly. You get a good finish and um, it's accessible at any store. So it, it really obviously depends on what you're spraying, what your budget is, um, and every situation's different, but I, I mean, I just rattled off a half dozen companies or brands or products that you can spray and get decent on-site finishes. And that's the, the brands you're talking about. Are we talking about a mixture of HVLP and airless sprayer? You could, or are those all formulated for one versus the other? No. And I think that so, there are some overlaps. So basically where I kind of draw the line, um, so it's speed and production and quality of finish. So HVLP is going to be much slower. But if you're looking for a cabinet grade finish, something that's either an air assisted like a Kremlin or um, <clears throat> a, a finer finish, you're probably going to want to go HVLP or conventional, something along those lines. It, you basically need a thinner coating um, and it doesn't pump out as much material. And then you can get away with an airless or an air assisted airless and get pr like, I get pretty good finishes. We just sprayed a mantle and I just sprayed cabinets with full airless cause I was in a huge time crunch. And uh, if you can move fast enough and you know what your, the materials that you're using, you can work it, but you're generally going to get a better finish on cabinets with an HVLP. And so let's, let's just quickly, I realize that we probably shouldn't skip past the explaining what HVLP and airless are for anybody in the audience who's, who's new to it. I'm just going to throw, um, throw the HVLP, uh, sorry, the airless setup on screen so you can describe uh, the setup and what you've got. Yeah, so basically airless is going to be using a pump um, and a piston to create a high pressure within your paint and then you have a fluid hose and there's no air introduced to that. You're basically spraying anywhere between 1500 and 25, 2800 PSI. So you have a ton of overspray and you have a ton of material coming out and then you adjust your finish with all different tips and tip sizes. Um, but so the, the smaller one is an airless, which 
you can shoot anything with airless. It's never going to have an issue breaking anything apart or atomizing anything. There may be finishes that are too thin that it just pumps out too much material. Um, but typically an airless is not going to be your best finish. The taller one, it's kind of in between airless and HVLP or conventional. Um, it's the same pump, but then it also has a separate turbine unit, which is just a compressor that you can introduce air at the tip of the sprayer itself. So I could run that as a pure airless and it's a different, it's a different sprayer. Um, or if you want air assisted, you basically can, what you can do is you can reduce the PSI that you're spraying. So you have less blowback, you have less waste of material, you have less overspray, and then you're introducing air at the tip of that. Um, with an HVLP, it's very, very low pressure. So you're basically depending on air at the tip to be atomizing and breaking apart that material completely. Right. Um, so, you know, there's airless, which is no air, air assisted, which is half and half. And then HVLP is basically a huge volume of low pressure air that you're depending on. So you, you have less overspray and typically you can get a finer finish and uh, a thinner build. So you don't have a clunky finish. And uh, are, are you using any, any thinners or, or conditioners or additives on any of these with so any of these sprayers? With an airless you're typically, I mean, you can, um, if you're using like a latex or something that it, a lot of the water-based finishes cure so quickly. So if you're spraying them and you want it to level out, you can add an extender, um, just so that it levels a little bit more because you're pumping out so much material. Um, so a lot of times if it's too heavy, you'll get orange peel. So with airless, you typically don't need it unless you're just trying to get a little bit nicer finish. Air assisted would be the same type of thing. Um, you can if you're just trying to better your finish, but you don't necessarily need to thin it because it has the ability to pump mud, basically. Um, and then HVLP, you're generally going to be thinning um, almost any water-based finish that you're going to be using. You could, you could probably, or you could definitely spray lacquers conversion varnishes, which are super thin, low build, um, without a thinner on them, depending on what you're shooting. But with HVLP, if you're trying to shoot something with like a four or five stage turbine and it's water-based, you're still going to want to be thinning either with water or, uh, some sort of thinner. All right. Do you, do you have a picture in here, Tyler, of the, um, of your, uh, HVLP. HVLP setup. There might be one in there somewhere. I know there was to... one in that article too. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm gonna pull that up. Um, it reminded me because uh, you mentioned um, the different turbine setups, um, and that, as I understand, I mean, in, in addition to a lot of factors, that seems to be the thing that uh, the way that HVLP companies are are organizing their products is like how much the, the the level of of turbine of the unit, right? And yeah. uh, so like a mini might four is is a four stage setup, right? And here at the lower right corner, this is um, at the time, which was a 2017, you were using this. Is that still the setup you have, the same mini might? Yep, I also have a pressure pot for it, which helps because okay. you can get rid of. So I have two different sprayers there. One is a relatively inexpensive one that I'm shooting um, shellac with. Right, and then I have a little bit, yeah, I have a little bit that's a, um, uh, siphon feed and then I have a gravity feed which with those it makes it a little bit tricky to get into tight spots so if you have a pressure pot you actually can build pressure in that and then you can keep more material and you can get rid of that um, siphon feed so now you basically have a fluid hose and then an air hose almost like the air assisted and then it's a little bit easier to get into tighter spaces and you have a better job of atomizing a finish. So I, I do have that now as well, which is probably how I would shoot that on that project because it'd make it easier. You have, you don't have to refill as much. Right. And that, so that's, it's an interesting thing to bring up. And I don't, you may have mentioned this with the, with the airless versus HVLP, but the airless, you're filling the entire, the entire hose from the bucket or the can to the sprayer. Um, whereas HVLP, you're just filling up either the pressure pot or, or the, or the, uh, 
the hopper on the top or underneath the gun, right? Yeah, so you can get a shorter fluid hose on an airless, but I mean, as a rule of thumb, no matter what you're shooting, you need at least two gallons because by the time you fill your fluid hose and your pump up with finish, you're about a quarter of the way through that, mm -hmm. uh, that first gallon. So, and then you're, you're just pumping so much material that there's a ton more waste than HVLP. So what are you doing for, um, well, let me, I'm going to close the loop on the, uh, on the turbine setup. Um, kind of, is the, is it fair to say that the shortcut in understanding the turbines is the, you know, the higher, the, 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 the number of stages, the thicker the material you can pump through with some, some muscle behind it. Yeah, basically. So, uh, I mean, I think here, what do you have? You have the mini mic four, so you have a four stage, um, which is yes. towards the higher end. I think five is the highest one Fuji makes, right? Yeah. So when I got that, I don't know if it was, they may have had a five. I know that four was, um, one of their higher turbine units. Everything started changing then because more and more people were trying to shoot water-based finishes, which are just typically thicker. Um, they're a heavier build and they're tougher to break apart than a lacquer, um, or a solvent based finish. So you mean so, people are trying to, sp trying to spray latex finishes? Yeah, basically, um, like a water based finish. It's just, it's much thicker than any sort of solvent based finish. So you could use a three stage turbine to shoot a solvent based finish because it's so thin right. and it doesn't have a ton of build to it and it'll break it apart fine adjusting your air and your your cap settings but if you're trying to shoot any of these water-based finishes you just need more um you need a, a more at least four or five stages i wouldn't ever buy anything under four stage and you don't if i at least last time i talked about this you wouldn't you were never spraying latex through your your no. hvlp right no i mean like no um i don't think that you shouldn't be spraying latex on um, anything. I, I generally don't even spray latex on trim anymore. I feel like it just gets beat up and there's so many acrylics um, that you can shoot that I think the blocking and the way that latex never really cures hard. There's so many good options out there right now. So we barely spray any sort of latex on trim at all. We've got a couple of questions that people wanted to know if you have any experience uh, with ML Campbell. Products. So I haven't used any, they probably have water at this point. Now it's one of the big names and solvent finishes. Um, a lot of cabinet shops use them. I think it's one of those things where it depends on who your dealer is, who your vendor is and who helps you out. I think that so many of those companies have comparable products and it's how that rep or that vendor is going to treat you. Um, but I know that there's, I haven't used any of their water base, but I know that they're, they're a big name in solvent based cabinet finishes. And do you ever use your, your HVLP setup to put stain on anything? Um, I've sprayed, no, typically anything that I've done, um, it would be a hand applied stain just cause we're not doing, I don't do a ton of stain work. Right. Um, so typically it would be clear coating with HVLP and actually doing the stain by hand. The thing is with the water base finishes, and then depending on what clears you're putting on, the finish is actually, the finished product is the finish. So like a polyurethane, you don't even need to sand your wood to a super high grit because that finish is so heavy and it's got so much body to it that you're creating that finish with that. So even if you hand applied stain, and then buffed it out or whatever you're doing, you don't necessarily, like, I wouldn't say that you'd need to be spraying a stain finish. Right. You're not looking to get dead smooth with the stain layer. Um, yeah. And, 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 and yeah, I, mean, I mean, we, we want even, consistent, we but um, so I haven't. Go ahead. I didn't say anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's get into prep because, um, you're reminding me of that because I'm, I'm remembering back to when we worked on this article and you were making the point that, um, and I think this is something that a lot of people overlook the importance of is, is when you're doing your initial prep work and you're priming, you're trying to get that as perfect as you can so that when you're putting on those finished coats, you're really just adding color. Like the top coats are, are like 
color, right? You're not trying to level things out at that point. You're not trying to hide anything. Yeah. So basically, and that's a, that's even more so with the solvent based finishes that it truly is color. You do have a tiny bit of build with the water base just because that water is the carrier there and it's a heavier carrier than the solvent based finishes. But I would, I never plan to get any sort of build or coverage or hide anything with the finish. So you're, what I, what I typically do depending on the wood species and what we're spraying is over, what we're spraying over is I'll seal that um, raw wood with something. If it's a cabinet, a lot of times I'll seal it with a clear shellac and that'll prevent that grain raise. Um, and then you can spray a high build primer over that. Or if it's a wood that has a ton of tannins that'll bleed, I'll just spray an inexpensive primer over it to kind of seal and block all those stains and then use a nicer buildable primer, sandable primer on top of that. So it's, it's generally a multi um, stage process, but the everything, especially with spray finishing, the spraying takes no time at all. You're sanding and you're vacuuming Mm -hmm. and you're filling. And then when you go to spray, you're cruising through a coat, of spray in no time. Um, and you, it's good and bad. You can do a lot of damage that way, but yeah, everything is in those prime coats and getting things ready for your finish. And once you get your finish, you're just cruising through that and then kind of scuffing between coats. Um, let's see here. We got a question about, um, okay. So you dip for the, but, uh, how your prep changes depending on the different surfaces you're, you're finishing. Um, can you talk a little bit about the sandpaper and um, what you know what you're using at different stages? I'm not sure yeah. I can answer this question. I don't know what, st- what grits <laughs> I actually end up grabbing. Yeah, so basically with anything that we're spraying um, on site, again, probably beating a dead horse, but it, it's got a lot of build to it. So for you, I don't even take stuff to 220. I'll sand raw wood to 150. Um, by the time you hit that with your first primer, it's going to raise so much grain that if you sanded it to 500, it wouldn't make a difference. Right. Um, so I'll sand to 150 and then we'll raise the grain and then I'll knock it down either with 150 or 220 at that point. And you just, are we talking build. hand sanding at that point or are you using machine and hand? It's a, it really depends. Um, if it's big open flats, you can get away with an orbital sander with a fine stroke. Um, And it depends if what primer you're using. If you know, if it's your final prime coat, you probably want to do it all by hand so that you're not getting swirl marks or you can't see the strokes of the sander. But on those first coats of primer where you're just looking to build grain up and knock it back down, it's fine to be using an orbital sander or um, a finished sander as long as you're going over it with more coats at that point. Um, And then when it gets towards the end, it's basically everything's getting sanded by hand, either with uh, the kid who worked for me, Matt, recently was actually a cabinet finisher. And he introduced me to those 3M almost Scotch-Brite looking pads. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are really good for getting into weird areas. And then I honestly use a ton of drywall sponges, just my old sponges from drywall. I throw into my paint bin because they're kind of broken down enough that they'll powder that trim up and not dig in or create marks. Yeah. Um, And then then again, so there's, there's people who will go and tack cloth stuff. Like I don't tack cloth stuff. If it's, if it's a flat and you're spraying a cabinet, yes, I will. But on our trim work, interior trim work, if it's mill work inside, if you vacuum it or wipe it quickly, I don't think that there's any need um, you're spraying such a heavy bodied finish that there's no need to tack that surface. Okay. And, um, I just wanted to, uh, something you said reminded me that, um, we never pulled a picture of your ultra high sheen finish that you did. Um, that blue one, I got to, I'm just going to pull the picture on, on Instagram real quick, um, to talk about how it might, how your process differs when it's, if it differs for a super, high gloss finish so that job we actually hired one of my friends uh lou from pen painting and he's the one who applied the finish we brought it up uh and got it prepped and ready for that 
but that was a solvent based finish inside the house. And we've not done that. And we have customers living there. So we handed that over to him. Um, but the, the prep process was just much more detailed and much more involved with any of those high sheens, even with the semi-gloss sheen, you're going to basically see every imperfection and every deficiency in that. So you need to make sure that all of your holes are filled multiple times and then sanded and everything's hand sanded and needs to be as perfect as possible. And then you start applying your primers and then another round of prep and then primers and another round of prep. So it's basically the same process, except you have more, um, you have a bunch more prime and sanding steps that you do because you're going over that a bunch of times. Um, and a lot of those small deficiencies, even if it's a nail head, that's somewhat indented. The only way that you're going to fill that is by blasting it with a ton of primer and then sanding over the whole thing. If you try and fill it with wood filler or Bondo or glazing putty, it just pulls right back out when you sand it. So there's a, Go so, ahead. so w w hit me that one more time. So when are you, when are you filling nail holes and when are you doing extra thick coats of primer? So basically there's a, a few different ways that you can do this. A lot of people don't start filling holes or caulking until you've at least primed once. Right. Um, so you seal up that wood. I don't think that paint goes into the nail heads or anything like that. Some people say that, but it makes it easier to see what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. you can see if you spray it with a white, you can see all of your nail heads and any cracks and any high spots and lows. So with that, we went through and I think we prepped things two or three times, just filling and sanding by hand. And then all of the really minor deficiencies, you can fill them a million times and sand them a million times. And it's so small that it's just going to pull all the filler right back out. So the only way to get that ultra smooth look at that point is to put an entire coat of primer over and then sand that primer. If not, you're just going to keep pulling the filler out of that. Cool. Okay. And how are you, I mean, with, with something like this, with something like these, uh, the high gloss blue cabinets, um, are we talking how many, how many layers of, of a lot, a lot. <laughs> I mean, there's, I would say ease. there's got to be probably six primes, um, like some spot priming, some full primes, and then usually you can get away with two or three finish coats on anything if you do a good job priming. Okay. Um, and what, um, what is your, your – we had a question. What's your filler of choice? Oh, so I actually don't use anything crazy. I'll use – something called crack shot or one time spackle. Mm -hmm. I know that glazing putty has kind of taken the Instagram market by storm and you see a ton of people using red glazing putty. I actually don't love it. Um, I think it shrinks a ton and it's harder to sand. So I have even used on. Are you talking about um, that super, the, like the double slate comes in a toothpaste tube for. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cause that's, we got to be careful because glazing putty, at least in my mind, is the stuff sure. you use for window panes. But I forget it's the like name a spot now. Spot glazing putty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more um, like an auto body kind of a thing, right? Yeah. So, but it shrinks more than normal bondo. But it's still, uh, it's tougher to sand. So I've even used on small stuff just regular spackle. Um, it's going to get covered by your primer and your finish, and it it'll hold up perfectly fine. Um, you're basically trying to reduce the amount of shrinking. So you wouldn't want to sp fill a huge hole with spackle, but I usually use, um, I'll use Bondo on bigger stuff or if I have a trim screw, uh, but then it's multiple times. There's, there's no, at least that I've found, there's no wood filler or putty that works magic and you're going to fill once and then prime and never see it again. It's, okay. it's filling and sanding and filling and sanding and then priming. And when you're, when you're at the finishing stage and that, you know, I've been on a number of your jobs and kind of, and anybody who follows you on Instagram sees kind of the daily updates of what you're working on. It seems like, um, you schedule things so that the finishing process is happening along with some other things. 
so that you can then do those multiple coats for stuff like fasteners, right? So you're putting a coat on and getting to do something else for the rest of the day and coming back to it. Yeah. And then it, so we've kind of switched on the past couple of remodels that have been larger. We can overlap to a certain extent, but then we've found, um, so a lot of our trim that we'll put up, even that cornice that you guys photographed, it's pre-primed. So yep. I'll get away with prepping that. And yeah, you're sanding some to bare wood, but at that point, like it's already been primed multiple times in the factory, buffed at the factory. Um, so I'm fine with prepping over top of that, caulking over top of that without having a prime on. So we'll, we'll sand that down and get everything good and then put another full coat or two of primer on depending on the job and the budget and everything else. Um, so usually with these, these fillers and these finishes, you could go and hit around with all your nail holes and your fillers and then just work your way around. And once you get to the other end of the room, you can sand it lightly and then hit it again and then sand it again. And then the last thing I do is caulk just so you're not sanding into that caulk or roughing it up or getting crap in that caulk. Right. And that, that is a great way to get a really crappy look yeah. real quick. <laughs> so then, you know, once you get all of those nail holes filled and all of your sanding done, then you're going to go through and vacuum everything off and then do an actual caulking. I'll even on some of that stuff. I know when you guys were out shooting this, if there's larger areas, um, we'll fill it with an adhesive and then basically skim that adhesive out. And then I'll spackle over top of that to float a lot of them. So we don't have huge caulk joints. Um, so rather than trying to scribe something to the ceiling, which sometimes you scribe, sometimes you don't, sometimes you can cheat it half and half, but we'll float a lot of that stuff out so that you don't have when you're spraying, you know, if you have semi-gloss paint against a uh, white ceiling, you keep that consistent reveal. Okay. Um, we had a question back from when you were talking about priming. Um, when you, when you say that you blast holes with primer, um, the Nathan wants to know, does that mean if you have like crazy runs underneath all the holes, you have to sand out and start sand out over and over again? No. So basically I wouldn't be priming again until like when I'm trying to cover with primer, we already have all of the filling done. So you're trying to, at that point, build and create this smooth coating over the entire trim. So initially your initial prime coat is to seal everything up. So you're going to spray a light, not a necessarily a tack coat, but a lighter coat and just get, get paint on that. You don't want to spray it too heavy, especially on that first. If you're, if you're working with raw trim, it's going to soak it up, but it also like it hits it and it will run at that point if it's not ready to completely absorb that finish. So you just want to get a quick coat on there and then you can knock it down and then you can start filling all of your holes um, and start prepping. And then once all of your holes are basically filled and you can't see them, then you go over with more primer and that's when you can kind of start putting that primer on a little bit heavier uh, once everything's filled. Cause then all of those tiny little nail heads and stuff where you're sanding the spackle or whatever back out of them, it kind of bites into them now. And when you sand it all by hand, they disappear. And so you can see the, I think you can see the photo of the baseboard. I just threw up on the screen, right? Um, this one now that's, that's a cornice. Unless uh, my screen's frozen. Oh, did it not? transition over let me see hmm there we go now you're looking at baseboard yeah um so this raises a question for me on how do you maintain sharp details when you're doing this level of sanding and filling i mean i can see um you know you start to i'm sure that this ended up looking great but it raises the question of um you get this in here you get this um things start to to get blurry and, and, and lose their sharp edge around the corner. So how do you, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? Um, so this job was actually one of the first jobs that we had um, Matt work for us and he came from cabinet finishing. Mm -hmm. So he 
prepped this stuff more. And we had the conversation that he prepped this more than it needed to be prepped for what we're doing. That being said, the trim that we're using here, which this angle doesn't really do it justice, but it has very deep profiles. Um, and anything that's sanded at that point, we basically sanded off the primer. You're not sanding the raw wood. So once you build your primer back up on that, you're not actually losing that much. You wouldn't want to be sanding into the raw wood or sanding the raw wood, but anything that you're taking out of that primer, typically that factory primer is such crap anyway, that whatever you take off of it is getting it closer to the profile that it should be anyway. Right. And here's another, I believe this is from the same job, right? Yeah. Um, so you can see, I mean, you can see even the chatter from the factory primer on that, that baseboard to the left, which when we, when I, when I prep, like I said, this, this job was Matt's first job. And I think I was away and I came back and he had everything sand. Like he spent way more time than he'd need to sand. But typically what I do, I don't even know if I have pictures here, but I'm only kind of knocking down that factory primer so they buff it from the factory but it's still heavy and you can still see sometimes where it's finger jointed and everything else so typically i'm just taking a sanding sponge and just smoothing all of that out and getting ready for our next layer of primer so at this point taking it down this much is actually unnecessary um, because you're just going to be trying to build it back up at that point and um, let's see here. We had another question that uh, that was on this topic, and I gotta find it. Oh, trim first or walls first? Uh, trim first. And why? Um, so we're not spraying our walls. We're spray our ceilings. Typically, it's top down. Um, but then basically, what we do is we will spray while we have the pump out. We'll spray all of our trim. Um, and then put away the sprayer and then we're protecting anything that we sprayed at that point and masking even, you know, if we sprayed baseboard, we're going to tape over that baseboard kind of tape and drape so that when we paint our walls, you're not getting that roller spit all over your brand new finished trim. Cause there's no sense in taking that amount of time to prep your trim and spray your trim and get a nice finish if you're just going to let your wall paint spit all over it. Um, so if you were to be trying to spray your trim after you've painted the walls, you'd have to be masking the walls and taping above the trim, um, which is, it'd be very difficult. And then it actually builds a lot. So you'd get this really hard line where when you pulled your tape, it would bridge and it wouldn't look very neat. Um, so we spray and then we knock down that overspray. I got to, I got to ask you when you talk about taping, because this photo right here, yeah, you were like, you're like the king of the, of the pulling off the tape video. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure there's been times where you've had bleed through, but um, it seems like never from the perfect world of Instagram. Um, how are you getting such good results along the edge of your taped, your masking tape? So I feel like, it always used to suck and it was so hard to do. Um, and people would say caulk over the tape, use a better tape. Like this frog tape does a really good job. Um, you're supposed to wet it after you put it on, but then probably one of the biggest secrets to this would be when I, you got to let your, your trim paint cure obviously for one. And then when you're taping over that, hit it with, not a super wet brush, like a half dry brush of your trim paint. So any bleed through that seeps through is your trim paint color. So then once that sets up, you can go and paint that edge with a light coat. And then when you come back on your second cut in, you can flood that and pull that tape off immediately to get a super clean line. Yeah. That's kind of genius. <laughs> yeah. And it works really well. And like they're any bleed throughs the trim color. Um, so you don't notice it. So it slows down the job a little bit, but it gives you better results in the end. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, and realistically I can, I can cut in by hand well, but 
even if you can cut it, you can't cut in as, as straight as tape for one, but then I have to protect that cap when I go to roll the walls. So mm -hmm. it, you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. So with all, before we move off the, the masking, um, there were some questions of when you talked about kind of floating these gaps, let's, especially where the, where the cornice meets the ceiling was the example you used. Yeah. What are you using for adhesive there? Are you talking about like a, like a construction adhesive? Yeah. So we always have, I put, that's like Frank's red hot. You can put that stuff on everything. Um, just like typical construction adhesive. I have it out when I put trim up, if I don't have wood or if it's an inside corner or our copes, we back caulk with just standard construction adhesive so I have it out so if there's an area on the ceiling like on the cornice here this was an afterthought so we did not flatten the ceiling so we had to put this cornice up and we had pretty tight reveals if you look on the underside where we couldn't cheat a ton um, and when we got around to our last kind of that crown with the cove detail there there were some areas where it was either high or low and we kind of split the difference. There was not much meat up top to scribe that down. So we kind of scribed as much as we could. And then the low spots, what we do is just take like almost like a caulk tube and squirt adhesive in there. So it's solid and it adheres to the ceiling. And if it ever gets hit, not that it would, that it's not going to go anywhere. It has a solid backing. And then I take a spackle blade and run it just like you're spackling an inside corner. And it basically cuts that adhesive perfectly straight. Um, and then when I go to spackle that in and kind of float that low spot or high spot in the ceiling down, it's backed by that adhesive. And you can just run your spackle blade along that and kind of float that nice and smooth. And then when you paint it, you can't tell that there's a high or a low at that transition line. Very cool. Um, we got some follow-ups on the tape trick. Um, one is, uh, wanted to know, does the overspray from the trim telegraph its sheen through the wall paint? Cause I'm, I'm assuming you're using different sheens for the trim and the wall, right? It w again, this is the same thing where I get this question all the time and it's, there's no secrets. If there's, if there is semi-gloss paint and you're painting over it with anything else, you just have to sand it know that it's it's going to telegraph if you don't address it so any time that we spray or any time that we spray trim you have to go and follow back and you have to sand everything that's on the wall afterwards and um that you mentioned switching the paint and somebody followed up with is it is it just a half mixture of trim paint and say water for the latex for the for the bleeding trick um for the when you're t going over the tape yeah no you basically just you want to have a drier paintbrush you're using your trim paint you just you don't want to flood that joint because if right. you flood that joint it's all going to go through so you're basically just trying to seal that tape so you don't you don't want to have a fully charged or loaded brush um let's talk about touch-ups nicks drips you know solving problems um we already talked about kind of uh the orange peel finish uh the nibs on the you know from settling onto the, the surfaces um what do you do when you have a you know a sag in the finish or a, a drip that's hardened do you try and address um, it while it's wet or leave it until it dries yeah. so you usually want to try and get to it while it's wet if you can um and whether you want to use a sponge you know if you're spraying trim it's tough you're, you're looking to, for a sprayed finish. You don't want to hit that drip with a brush. Um, then you're going to be sanding out brush marks. So whether it's a sponge or a foam roller, you just kind of want to even that out. If you can't get to it, you either need to sand it or you could get a card scraper and scrape it after the fact. Um, touching up finishes is an art in and of itself. So you can you could spray something and touch it up uh, and where you sprayed it heavy and it levels out and it kind of flashes off, it'll look perfect. But when you get around the edges, you'll have that overspray where it wasn't a full coat and you'll notice it. So you can do that and then you can buff that out with either wet sanding it or different grits of sandpaper. And when you're, you're at that point, you're in like the thousand grits, you know, you're not, you're basically creating a sheen again, because 
you're going from where you have a full semi-gloss sheen and then your oversprays closer to a satin or a matte sheen and then you have your semi-gloss where you're touched up so you're trying to blend them a lot of times all i do is after we get done trim paint i'll leave my pump loaded overnight and just put it in water it's a closed system so it's not going to hurt anything and then if we need to i'll just mask to a corner or spray and take, you know, if I, if I have a 15 foot piece of baseboard, it's almost easier just to mask above that and just spray that really quickly. The whole thing. Right. Um, even if it's a door, it's like, all right, mask off that one door or tape it on where a style and a rail meet so that you have that transition line. You're not going to be able to spray that and overlap both of them and have it look good. So if you tape it off right on that part, you can spray it and you won't notice. So, and I mean, I'm not saying you would necessarily do this, but let's say that you have this cornice job and, and the customer calls you back and they say, Hey, there's a Nick, you know, somebody was playing baseball in the house and they put a Nick in the, in, in one of these pieces of crown. Is it rather than having to spray the whole thing, could you just say, you know, delineate between two pieces and say, my Nick is here. I'm going to, so I'm going to mask above and below and just finish this piece. Yeah, that that's what I would do. There's guys out there like finishing wizards who would be able to touch that up by hand um, and make it disappear. I just, it's never anything that I've done. Um, but there's guys who would be able to go in with a brush and touch that up and then wet sand that and make it go away. The easiest thing for me, honestly, is to go in and tape that off and just spray that one section. Right. Um, you mentioned uh, leaving your, your pump in water. Uh, can you talk about how you handle um, cleaning of your, of your gear when you're working in somebody else's house? Yeah, so I typically put every, I mean, I'm cleaning into buckets and then we're dumping, it's all water-based. So we're dumping somewhere that it's not going to be seen um, and it's not going to be killing plants or killing dogs. Um, so we're typically, we're spraying inside. So I'll have a bunch of buckets that are all set up for us to clean everything and then get rid of it. Whether it's in a utility sink, um, you can dump all of the actual, you know, that, that paint in the water will separate from itself. So you could dump off the top of the water and then dump basically the, the leftover paint into a trash bag and then clean it into a slop sink or utility sink. Um, but I'm cleaning... When we're done, I'm basically flushing the entire pump and all of the fluid lines. And then you're going to be putting, I use an RV antifreeze to load everything up. So the latex doesn't dry inside the lines. And so you don't get any freezing. Um, but if I'm not done spraying overnight, I'll basically relieve the pressure in the pump, clean any paint that's on the surface or in the siphon tube. Um, and then clean all of your, your tips, your needle sets. And then I'll just dunk everything in water and just leave it in water. Cause it's a closed system at that point And you're not going to have any issues. HVLP is different. Um, you're going to want to have to clean that out basically entirely whenever you're done, but it's, it's a smaller gun, a smaller setup. So it's a little bit easier. And I, and you can, you can also just submerge that whole system in water if you need to, you know, bring it home and do it later that night. Right. Yeah. And then you can also, even on the tip, you could take some Andy or some petroleum jelly and just kind of push over the front of that and it'll keep things from drying up until you can clean that. You just want to make sure you get that off there before you start spraying again. So you don't introduce that into your finish. And uh, let's wrap up here by talking about budget for a finishing job. Cause I mean, it sounds like this is a lot of hours going into this. You put a lot of hours into everything, but um how does a mere mortal think about budgeting for a finishing job, especially if you haven't done, I mean, I guess at this point, do you just know how long things take you? Yeah. So I, I just kind of put a, uh, on our jobs, they're relatively small. Um, so I just put a number on our paint work and I, I kind of know what, how much time I'm going to have on paint. What I did for a lot of years, which I think I, Bang. I was, I always used to hate painting to be completely honest. I couldn't stand it. And the reason was because I had this mindset and this mentality that you couldn't charge for painting. 
there was no money in painting. You know, you had to paint a room for 600 bucks or 800 bucks. And I would sit there and be like, I can't get through this fast enough. I can't clean my brushes fast enough. Uh, there's no room for setting a protection and drop cloths and everything else. And at this point, that's just part of our job and that's part of our package. And I realized that what we're putting into paint is more than a lot of people are putting into paint. So we're just selling it that way. And it's, it's not even that I'm selling that to the customer as much that that's just the cost of what our paint job is. And our paint job is going to be more money than a lot of people who are doing paint, but going into it, our customers know that. So even the job that we're on now, I just figured out how many days I think I have of painting and how many days I have of prep. And then honestly, once I get into it, and you're able to set up and you're able to start making things really nice and sanding and filling and kind of, you start to see that come to life. You forget about what you charge for it. You forget about how much time, if it takes an extra day, it takes an extra two days. To me, it doesn't really matter because that paint job makes all the difference at the end of the day. So we just kind of get it done at that point. Cool. All right. Well, that's going to bring us up to an hour and it seems like a good place to stop. Um, we didn't get through every one of the questions. Um, some of them were repetitive, uh, but that's okay. You guys can always send us the questions and we'll try and get back to you. Um, and again, this is going to be archived on our website at finehomebuilding.com slash webinars. Tyler, you can follow on Instagram, TRG Home Concepts. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll be back for some other, other talks. Um, Tyler, thanks for spending the time. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. We'll see you for the next one. Thanks.